Good evening. Welcome to Istanbul Modern. <coughs> I'm Levent Çalıkoğlu. This evening we will have the new lecture of our new series, Museum Talk from the USA, and Christopher Wisniewski is our guest. Christopher is the deputy director of for education and visitor experience at the Museum of the Moving Image, New York. First of all, I would like to thank him for joining us. Welcome to Istanbul Modern. Christopher is going to discuss the changing field of museum education and the ways in which museums can use educational activities to complete school-based learning, also to engage diverse audience in this context. I would like to briefly introduce this lecture series, the Museum Talk from the USA, and for our audience who join us this evening for the first time. As today, we will have significant guests from leading American museums, and we will continue to have one or two lectures from an important speaker each month. Each lecture is about a key topic, such as museum management, curatorial practices, collections and archive, audience development and public relations, education and social programs, events, local and global marketing and communication strategies, new technologies, redefinition of space and museum architecture. The history of museology and the art institutions in the USA have laid impressions on today's museum practices and left an impact on the proceedings of cultural institutions all around the world. In this respect, museum directors, curators and department directors from established art museums in the USA will be invited to share their knowledge and experience. And I truly believe this series is an important reference and guide for museum studies in Turkey. Istanbul Modern is making this series in partnership with, with US Mission in Turkey. And I would like to thank them for this wonderful cooperation. Now I will give the floor to Christopher and thank you. All right, um, good evening everybody and uh, thank you for coming this evening. Again, my name is Chris Wisniewski and I am the Deputy Director for Education and Visitor Experience at Museum of the Moving Image in Queens, New York. Um, I'd like to start, first of all, by thanking the entire staff of the Istanbul Modern uh, for their extraordinary hospitality um, and uh, express my gratitude. Um, and um, it's been a pleasure to share my thoughts about museum education with them today and um, to also now share some thoughts with you. Um, and hopefully after I'm done, we can engage in uh, something more of a dialogue. But for now, museums are, by definition, conservative institutions. With rare exception, most museums collect objects of some kind. And to whatever discree, degree possible, we are always striving to prevent the wear and tear of time to sort of lock the objects in our collection at a fixed moment in time, to preserve them. And also, in collecting these objects, we're canonizing them. We're saying that there's something worthy about them um, that makes them important for future generations to have access to them. The fundamentally conservative nature of these central activities is for better and for worse, I think, a part of the collective understanding that we all have about museums. And so as a result, too often, I think, museums are viewed in the public imagination as stodgy and resistant to change to borrow a phrase from T.S. Eliot, still points in a turning world. Such tired notions hardly capture the essence of the 21st century museum, or I would argue a place like Museum of the Moving Image. The only museum in the United States dedicated to the art, history, and technology of film, television, and digital media. In short, screen culture in all its forms. Our very name suggests both an open-endedness open and a, a, a fixedness, there's a contradiction embedded in the very idea of our museum. The moving image is, as a subject, in a constant state of flux. And in deciding to call us a museum of the moving image instead of a museum of film and television, our founding director, Rochelle Sloven, allowed for the possibility that the very nature of the institution would and might have to change as the moving Im image itself changed. So the certainty of, of the museum as an institution is fundamentally uncertain. 
So over here, let's. So here, you're looking at the museum's building many, many years ago. Um, it looks dilapidated, but I hope you get that sense of, of permanence here. The moving image as an art form and medium resists fixedness. It's by definition ephemeral and, at this point, non-physical. Sorry. My apologies. And this is a tension, this tension between the fixedness of a museum and this sort of ephemerality of our subject matter that is negotiated in our renovated and expanded facility that was designed by Thomas Lacer and which opened to the public after three years of construction in January of 2011. The, muse the museum's building is designed to suggest lightness and flow and to surprise visitors with constant, unexpected encounters with moving images from their reflection in the facade of the building as they enter to an encounter with a 50-foot video panorama as they come into the lobby to the screen that they literally walk through um, upon ascending the grand stair into the second floor. Of course, we also have a movie theater which is designed expressly to present the moving image as a voyage through space and time. And even our new education center, which occupies a huge part of the footprint of the new building, greets young people with a moving image as they enter. It is from this perspective, then, of tension between fixedness and change, between the conservatism that museums sometimes seem to embody, and the near constant change that techno technological innovations have brought to our field generally, and to the Museum of the Moving Image in particular, that I would like to approach the topic of museum education and to investigate in this brief lecture whom we educate, how we educate, and what we hope to accomplish by doing so. In the process, I'll attempt to provide you with some background on the Museum of the Moving Image, as well as some other examples in the field, and I'll try to use the experiences that I've had as an educator and administrator to illuminate something of a broader technological and theoretical framework. So I want to start with what should be a simple question. Why do museums have education programs in the first place? If the answer to the question seems obvious, it's only because it's too easy to take the work that we do for granted to assume that museums should have education departments, right? But why? Why isn't it enough to care for our collections or to do high quality research, to present exhibitions, or to publish excellent scholarly material? And who says that museums are even good at educating in the first place? Isn't that the job of schools or after-school programs or other kinds of edu more overtly educational organizations? Any individual museum's answer to this question, why have museum education programs, should inform every aspect of, the, of what they do from operations through programming. In Making Museums Matter, Stephen Weil, the former deputy director of the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, D.C., offers the following argument. Over three decades, what the museum might be envisioned as offering to the public has grown from mere refreshment to education to nothing short of communal empowerment. While here is charting what he sees as a post-World War II development in American museum practice that he believes marks a shifting emphasis from internally focused activities that include research, preservation, and collection stewardship, to more audience and community-based efforts like exhibitions, education, and public programs. This shift seems only to be intensifying with time. So look, for example, at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago, which is a world-class institution by almost any standard. Just recently, they announced a drastic reduction in, it, in their staff devoted to research activities and they refocus their mission that basically reduces, and in the process, reduce the staff into four main areas. Two that are principally administrative, and the others falling into science and education, 
and programming. The salient point here is that in an environment in which museums are competing for diminishing funds from public and private sources, we have found, we've been forced to do a better job of seeking earned income, of providing services of measurable value to our communities, and of communi communicating the value of the services that we provide to potential funders. Educational and public programs are often a centerpiece of these efforts for reasons that are both practical and philosophical. And by philosophical, one might argue ethical. To put a fine point on it, the fact that American not-for-profits exist receiving public support often from the cities that, they, that they're occupied, that they're located in, or their states, or the federal government, or even simply that because of their nonprofit status, their donors enjoy tax exemptions, that means that we exist to one extent or another to serve the public trust. And with that comes a certain responsibility to the communities that we serve. And this is really the heart of the 21st century museum. The idea that we can be creating virtuous circles. By serving our community, we have greater evidence of the value of museums that we can then communicate to potential funders, which allow us to do a better job of serving our community. On its website, the American Alliance of Museums, the leading uh, professional organization of museums in the United States, has a section called About Museums. It begins with several facts. There are over 600 or 850 million visits to American museums per year, more than attendees of all major sporting events and theme parks combined. Museums directly contribute more than $21 billion to the national economy. Museums invest more than $2 billion a year in education, and 400,000 people nationwide are employed by museums. Note that these facts draw attention to three social goods museums provide. We drive tourism, we drive economic growth, and we educate. As the Museum of the Moving Images Government Affairs representative, I can tell you that it is precisely these arguments that we make to our community leaders and elected officials in advocating for public support. They speak directly to the community benefits we provide as museums and the return on public investment that is both financial and educational that comes from investing in museums. In the same section of the AAM's website, there is a page called Facts. The first fact listed is, museums serve the public. And the first bullet cites museum education programs as an example of that service. This is anecdotal evidence of the increasingly central role that museum education programs play in the 21st century museum. It's evidence that we're no longer simply content to call ourselves, to put it in a, a blunt and unfair way, mere cabinets of curiosity, however worthy or important we think the curiosities in our cabinets are, but that we are hubs now of teaching and learning. Museum of the Moving Image does generate significant earned income and unearned revenue from our education programs. We are and have been for at least six years booked to capacity with school children. We serve 50,000 young people every year. And our students do pay a modest admission fee. We also are able to secure money from corporate, foundation, and private donors for these activities. I make this point with a caveat, though, that I would never say that our education programs pay for themselves without also saying that education is at the heart of everything that we do. We occupy a building located in Astoria, Queens. We're on the site of a historic studio that was founded in 1920 by Paramount Pictures. After Paramount left, the U.S. Army took the site over and operated it until the 70s when it fell into a state of disrepair, at which point a consortium of elected officials, 
labor union and guild members, and other concerned citizens created a foundation that set as its mission the rehabilitation of the studio. When that was complete, in the early 1980s, our founding director, who was the director of the foundation, Rochelle Sloven, um, decided that the mission should be changed. And that instead, the new mission of the foundation should be the creation of a museum of film and television on the site. We exist because we serve an educational purpose. And we were charted, chartered as an educational institution. Our building is owned by the city of New York, and education is at the heart of our mission. As a relatively young institution, one might think of Moving Image as the sort of museum that typ typifies the shifting valence of the museum industry that Weil was describing. We have always said, for example, that the objects that we collect, which now number over 130,000, are collected to be exhibited. We do not collect for the sake of the objects themselves, but for what those objects might communicate or teach visitors when exhibited in our galleries. The single largest commitment of real estate at the museum belongs to our core exhibition behind the screen, which occupies two floors and tells the story of how movies, television shows, and video games are made, marketed, and shown. For all intents and purposes, Ms. Sloven is the chief curator of Behind the Screen, though significant debt is owed to our chief curator, David Schwartz, and to our current um, executive director, Carl Goodman, who was the world's first curator of digital media, who um, conceived all of the interactive experiences that populate our galleries. During our expansion and renovation, Behind the Screen was completely reconceived and renovated. I'm proud to say that I was on the curatorial committee that reimagined behind the screen. But I would also argue that my presence on that committee was a reflection of an institutional commitment. We see our galleries not simply as a space for the general public to access our collection. We see our core exhibition as a learning environment. After all, about one in every four visitors to behind the screen is a student visiting on a field trip. And the seriousness with which my colleagues take that led them to take my suggestions and input on the curatorial committee with the utmost seriousness. It's a reflection of the central educational service we provide and its centrality to our mission. At Moving Image, we offer three basic types of programs to school students. Exhibition tours, educational screening programs, and workshops. Because of the highly technical nature of our subject matter, we've always focused on a slightly older student, so those who are roughly nine years old and older. These programs have multiple purposes. There is a sense in which our programs can be categorized as artistic and cultural in nature, we're using our galleries as spaces to teach young people how moving images are made, marketed, and shown, and to give them a deeper appreciation of the media that surrounds them on screens large and small. At the same time, our programs help teach the curricular subject matter that students need to learn in order to proceed to college, what is referred to in the United States as the core curriculum, subjects like English language arts, social studies and American history, and math, science, and technology. This starts with the exhibition tour. Behind the screen dynamically bends, blends over 1,400 objects, commissioned artworks, moving image material, and interactive experiences. It allows us to use the relatability of our subject matter to stimulate young people's interest in the learning experience that we're helping to provide, to get them to think more deeply about the moving images they consume, and to make them more informed and aware of viewers and makers of media. In short, to get them to draw connections between the movies and television and video games they love and academic subject areas that include those core curriculum areas of math, science, and technology, American history, and English language arts. Because behind the screen is organized more or less by creative process, 
It also allows us to teach them about careers in the field. This exhibition was conceived, curated, and designed with input from our education team. And I can't say that our input was always decisive, but I can say that we always took that input seriously. Behind the screen is fundamentally hands-on in nature. Visitors can create flipbooks. They can make short stop motions of themselves. They can record their voices into scenes from movies and TV shows. The exhibition is designed to be open to visitors of many different abilities and learning styles. And it's designed to be our primary teaching tool. In addition to the tour of Behind the Screen, we offer supplemental activities for school groups, tours of our changing and temporary exhibition, as well as educational screening programs like Screening America. In Screening America, we're showing historic films and television episodes. On one hand, it's sort of an art appreciation program because we show great works like Charles Chaplin's The Immigrant. But on the other hand, we're also using them to teach important subjects in the American history curriculum. So we're treating the moving image both as an art form and as a historic artifact. In similar fashion, we have hands-on workshops that extend some of the ideas that are introduced in Behind the Screen, but also allow young people to learn a little bit more about the math and science topics that were previously discussed on the tour. Rather than simply developing education programs that teach students about film, television, and digital media, we have always grounded these school group programs in the core curriculum, those subjects that are tested to measure student learning and successful teaching in schools around the country. This is that key question again, right? Why have museum education programs? And for us, the answer affects every aspect of our practice, right? We're saying that we're teaching the core curriculum. And we do that partly for practical reasons. It's easier for teachers to justify a visit to the museum if they can tie that visit to things that their stu students need to learn anyway. It also helps us do a better job of articulating the value of our education programs. So for example, when the Guggenheim Museum in New York successfully showed that their semester-long learning through art program had positive impact on student test scores in English language arts, they were left with a concrete, measurable piece of data that they could take to potential funders, to teachers, to principals, to school systems, to advocate for the value of their programs specifically and arts education more generally. Meanwhile, Schools are under increasing budgetary pressure that has resulted in cuts to arts programming across the United States. Four years ago, the New York City Department of Education replaced the Project Arts Program, which required a certain percentage of the, um, of the school's budget to go specifically to arts education, with something that is called Arts Count, that dramatically scaled back the required amount of uh, money that needed to be spent on the arts. Since then, funding for the arts, for art supplies in New York City public schools has fallen by nearly 70%. And arts instruction is increasingly outsourced to cultural institutions and museums like our own. 62% of New York City public school principals report severe budget constraints that prevent them from offering the level of arts instruction that they would prefer to. Paul King, who runs the uh, Office of the Arts and Special Projects at the New York City Department of Education estimates that, that um, instruction by arts and cultural organizations is up 25% in the schools to fill this gap. Put simply, in the United States, it is now too often the case that the only arts instruction students receive is that provided by cultural institutions like museums, and it is also true that it is easier for schools to justify spending money on arts instruction when those museums and cultural organizations can tie the programs they provide to the core curriculum. Meanwhile, curriculum standards are changing. Because of changes to the way that states across the country are receiving federal funding for education, 
Almost every state in the country has adopted a, a national set of standards in a few key subject areas, and this is referred to as the Common Core. The Common Core's cross-cutting goal is to make students college and career ready by the time they graduate high school. And its methodology is actually similar to ours at the museum. It's interdisciplinary. There are two Common Core subject areas, math and English language arts. The English language arts Common Core includes standards that actually also relate to social studies and math and science. It also includes what are called cross-cutting anchor standards. And I'd like to draw your attention to anchor standard seven up here. Students should be able to integrate and evaluate content presented in diverse media and formats, including visually and quantitatively, as well as in words. So what we've seen is that the Common Core now has embedded within it this idea that 21st century skills for college and career readiness for 21st century citizenship involve visual and media fluency. This suggests a number of things. First, teachers across disciplines need to be equipped with the skills they need to teach these visual and media fluencies in their classrooms. That means that organizations like ours need to be providing teacher training. And we've partnered with the Department of Education to provide ongoing training for teachers. We have workshops for teachers that can be booked on professional development days designated by the city. We have a week-long institute that we offer teachers in the summer to help them think about how they can take the integrated approach mandated by the Common Core in their classroom. Because too often, teachers do not get this sort of training when they're training to become teachers. Second, this anchor standard suggests that the government officials and curriculum designers responsible for the Common Core have followed many funders, educational theorists, and arts and cultural organizations in recognizing the potentially transformative impact of technology in 21st century education. For example, the White House now employs a video game czar charged in part with studying and advocating for the educational use of video games in the classroom. Such initiatives align perfectly with what we've been doing at the museum for close to 25 years, even if many schools are still resistant to bringing this sort of instruction into the classroom, or even if many schools are ill-equipped to do so. Third and finally, the Common Core explicitly makes schools accountable for making young people visually, media, and digital media fluent as a requirement for elementary, middle, and secondary education. So it's no longer possible or tenable to pretend that visual and media fluency are not essential 21st century skills. But this comes at a time when schools can't provide that sort of instruction in the classroom. So the rhetoric is persuasive. But too often, these essential skills get outsourced to different times of the day, what we call out of school time. And one of the things that I found in my near eight years at the museum is that our school group programs have been booked to capacity and they're very successful. But the huge area of growth that we've seen has been in the out of school time area. So that means after school programs offered at schools or at the museum. It means family programs on the weekends um, offered as drop-in or scheduled workshops. It means special day-long workshops on the weekend. It means week-long camps during school breaks or during the summer. I would argue that the change that we're seeing here is the, is the result of a confluence of many factors. That includes the priorities of funders, the pressures on schools, the institutional capacity of organizations like ours, and the spaces that are most conducive to innovative programming. So when I started at the museum, we basically had no out-of-school time programming. Now we're in eight different schools across the city 
offering animation and video game design courses. And here I'll, uh, I'll pause for a second from talking to show you some work that was made our very first year of doing this by some students um, who were in one of the museum's programs. So this is a very simple activity um, that takes the flip books they made of themselves in the museum and gives them a chance to, to draw an animation on top of those flip books and then reanimate them. During school break on the summer, we offer programs that range from claymation to video game design to physical computing. We've also partnered with numerous organizations to prevent after school classes and courses and intensive camps on a variety of subjects. And these can range from the creation of machinima, which are short animated movies made using a video game engine to the creation of political campaign ads. These out-of-school time programs give young people the chance to move into the realm of media production, though I should qualify that statement by saying that most are already creating. The Pew Research Center has found that over 50% of American teens engage in some sort of content creation. But that can be very passive in nature, like the creation of a Facebook page, or mashing up a previously existing YouTube video. At the museum, in both our school group and our less formal out of school time programs, we give young people a context for that kind of work that they're already doing on their own. Through the encounter with objects, demonstrations and interactive experiences, critical viewing and more, we're trying to provide historical and conceptual perspective for their creative pursuits. They may already be editing on their phones, but they don't necessarily know why a professional editor might choose to pace a scene in a certain way or cut from one camera angle to another. We strive for both our school group visitors and especially in our more intensive out of school time programs to bridge that gap. Our out of school time programs, which have radically transformed our education department in under a decade, have also allowed us to take advantage of our physical resources in times when our building is underutilized. So if we're booked to capacity on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday from 10 to 2, what we want to be doing is using the resources of the museum itself, especially now that we have a huge education center, um, in times when it wouldn't be utilized, after the hour of 2 p.m. during the week, on the weekends, during school breaks. Finally, it allows us to have a space that is not tethered to um, curricular goals that are required by schools to be more experimental in our use of technology in education. Digital media has always been more than a tool the museum uses to engage visitors or to teach young people. It's a part of our subject matter. We presented our first video game exhibition a year after we opened, and our executive director, as I mentioned previously, was the world's first curator of digital media. Today, most media is digital, and Museum of the Moving Image is poised to benefit from a turn in teaching and learning towards the digital, an acknowledgement that young people need to learn how to use digital tools and to participate in a digitally mediated culture. We often flatter ourselves to say that we were doing this before everyone else, but a lot of people have now caught up and we're certainly not the only institution with robust programming around digital media, especially for teens. I would cite the Museum of, the, of Modern Art, the Hirshhorn, and the Walker Art Center as all excellent examples of those efforts. The digital turn must be understood, though, in a broader context, one that includes a growing philanthropic and research interest in informal learning, and its relationship to those aspects of traditional instruction that have been increasingly pushed out of the school curriculum, like arts education. The John D. and Catherine T. Rockefeller Foundation, or MacArthur Foundation, excuse me, <laughs> has been a leader in the, the efforts to both understand and push forward digital media's relationship to learning, 
investing tens of millions of dollars in, in an effort that's referred to as digital media and learning. And it touches on three different areas, research, practice, and field building. I want to show you a, a brief news report that was done about a program that we offered um, that was supported with seed money from MacArthur to give you a sense of exactly the kinds of efforts to which I'm referring here. We're going to cut it off before he plugs the uh, parent company of, of New York One. Um, I, I'm, I'm going off script for a second. I want to mention that young woman that you saw, Nora Ismail, in that report. She's an example of, uh, of the power that these less formal, um, more intensive learning activities have to influence youth and to shape their lives. So Noor first entered our after school program at her school when she was in sixth grade. She's participated for the past four years. After that, she participated in the game design lab. After that, she became a volunteer and peer instructor in our summer media camps. And Nora wants to sign up for the after school program again this year, right? So through that repeated exposure and that intensive exposure, we've had the opportunity to create in this young person someone who has been profoundly affected by the museum's education programming, and who has already, in her way, given back by volunteering her time, which is an extraordinary thing. You know, we always, you know, we, we talk about the, the potential to, uh, to grow our funding base with excellent education programs, but the kind of in-kind support that our volunteers give because they are touched by what they do or inspired by what they do is equally valuable. And um, so I, I, I love pointing that young person out. Um, and she's not, she's not the only one. So we've had a number of projects that have been funded through this MacArthur money. Um, and uh, that money goes to support a wider network of organizations, of which we're one of 39, called the Hive New York City Digital Learning Network. And uh, all of those projects need to be collaborative. So there we were working with the Institute of Play to develop new curriculum. We worked with the um, YMCA of Greater New York, an organization that provides excellent um, out-of-school time programming to do a political ad-making workshop. Um, we're working with another after-school provider in uh, the South Bronx to take young people on field trips to research labs where they'll see innovative new technologies that people would not otherwise have access to because they're not commercially available. They're going to see those demonstrated. They're going to hear about careers in technology fields. And then they're going to develop prototypes based on what they've seen. We're grateful for all of this support. We really, really are. Um, and yet, despite the impact of technology on the field, I don't necessarily follow an assumption that often underlies a lot of the support for these types of programs that digital media has fundamentally transformed the way that young people learn. 
USC professor Mimi Ito, who's a leader in this digital media and learning world, um, notes that it's not actually the technology itself that's really driving the change. It's really the digitally enabled networks and the social practices that spring up around them that are changing the context and the ways in which young people learn. So out of this movement has emerged a kind of new pedagogical framework for um, how we should think about how young people learn. It's called Connected Learning. Um, and I'm going to quote from the Digital Media and Learning um, website to describe it for you. In March 2012, a set of researchers introduced a new model of learning, connected learning, that taps into the rich new world of information, knowledge, and online collaboration available to youth and learners. Connected learning suggests an approach to education that integrates and connects learning across different settings in a young person's life, including in school, after school, and home environments." End quote. So connected learning then is grounded in the recognition that young people have moved across different spheres and across different spaces in which learning happens. The learners are the same, the contexts are different. It might be a school, it might be a museum gallery, it might be their bedroom, it might be an online network. The connected learning model has numerous prescriptions for learning activities. Among them, that learning activities should be interest-powered, that they should be production-centered, that they should have a shared purpose, and that they should have full participation. This new model sounds awfully familiar. Education is a social process, wrote the educational theorist John Dewey about a century ago, quoting Dewey, give the pupils something to do not something to learn. If the doing is of such a nature as to demand thinking, learning naturally results. Dewey argued that education is social in nature, that the context of learning matters, that learning should be active rather than passive, that it should involve working through problems that relate to real experiences and build off of the interests students already have. In other words, I would suggest that this new model of connected learning put forward in 2012 resembles the pedagogy that Dewey advocated for at the beginning of the 20th century. We've known for about 100 years that young people learn best when they are engaged, when education is seen as experiential and not the imparting of facts. Sound pedagogy has not changed simply because we have new digital tools at our disposal. The, capable, the capability of museums to deliver sound learning experiences might have grown, though. The old model of the museum as a keeper of knowledge seems distressingly similar to Dewey's model of the instructor as the keeper of knowledge. The 21st century museum, conceived as a hub of teaching and learning, a place that is experiential, that engages visitors in active looking and conversation, a space that is social and communal. That feels like a place that Dewey would have thought is a place where learning can happen. Learning doesn't change. The social context, spaces, and networks that support teaching and learning do change. Schools change. The tools young people use to communicate with one another to play and to get information all also change. And yes, museums change. 20 years ago, we had a gallery exhibition called The Living Room Candidate, which featured video monitors playing historic presidential campaign commercials in a gallery. Today, the museum presents the Living Room Candidate as a media-rich online archive of over 400 historic presidential campaign commercials. It features lesson plans, online interactive learning activities. It's visited by millions of people around the world. It's used by classrooms around the country and, yes, around the world. What was once a physical installation occupying one floor of our Queen's home is now an online resource that is global. 
the Museum of Modern Art just launched a new learning app called the Art Lab, which turns a young person's iPad into an art making tool. The Dallas Museum of Art has eliminated admissions fees and it's introduced a free membership program that ties participation in activities at the museum to digital badges that visitors can earn by coming. A sort of like externally visible sign that you're going to museums and you're learning something from them. Like the living room candidate, efforts like this upend conventional understandings about how museums teach. But they have something in common. They're all grounded in the understanding that museums do teach. That is an essential and perhaps the essential aspect of what we do. I am convinced that the centrality of education for the 21st century museum is only going to grow. At Museum of the Moving Image, we've never had the luxury of standing still. With a mission that's partly devoted to the digital, a subject matter that is constantly evolving, and a physical home that is located in an area of New York City that is transforming rapidly, and that is more ethnically and racially diverse than any other place in the entire United States of America. We have never had any other choice but to embrace change when it comes, and hopefully to get out in front of the change. But we will always be chartered as an educational institution. And however much we might need to modify our mission to accommodate new media forms, or changing institutional priorities, or changing demographics in our neighborhood, I can say here with certainty that the heart of the mission of the Museum of the Moving Image will always be education. I welcome your questions. Now, was I too emphatic? Or? Okay, I thought we were waiting for somebody else to ask. <laughs> so slow down. Uh, so Christopher, thank you again for all the information, starting from the daytime and also <laughs> now. Um, my question is, um, in those workshops or training programs you're serving to different age groups, do you have any takeaway in educational instruments that you have designed? Right. Um, we, uh, it depends on the context, but uh, for anything that is uh, what I would say uh, in a program taking place informally, um, so not, not for school groups, um, but where we have visitors from off the street um, coming to the museum to participate in a workshop, uh, we always want there to be a takeaway. And that's even true in our exhibitions. So, um, you know, I had mentioned, for example, that in Behind the Screen we have an interactive experience where visitors can create short stop motion animations. They can email those to themselves. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a terrific branded um, takeaway from the museum that, um, allows them to uh, reflect on their experience and to take their experience forward. Um, but especially when we have uh, young people, um, or adults for that matter, coming for something that is uh, you know, a, a little bit more of a, a, a substantive deep dive program, um, we always want them to be walking away with something. group them uh, according to their interest and age groups? Yes. So um, again, it's going to def depend on the individual format of the program, but I will give you, I'll give you an example. Our, our summer media camps. So in the summer, we have these week-long camps. Um, the, the first is normally a, a sort of introduction to video production. The second is a, an animation week, and the third is a video game design week. Um, those are broken out into, um, into age groups. So we have a section for children ages 9 to 11 and then one for ages 12 to up, 12 and up. Uh, we tend to do better with uh, in informal programming with the young teen than the older teen. Um, and then within those classes, um, almost all of, the, all of the work we do, especially when it's production oriented, uh, is forced collaboration. Uh, we, we believe that our subject matter um, is a collaborative one by nature. Um, 
film, television, and video games are generally not made by individuals, but they're made by teams of people working together. And so it's important to us from a career awareness standpoint to, um, to um, introduce them to that kind of production work as a collaborative process. Um, and then within those, within those teams, different people tend to assume different roles. Um, and that's for two reasons. Again, it's, uh, it um, more resembles the real process of making, but also it's sound pedagogy. Um, because uh, the idea is that um, not every young person has the same interests. And in order to make those sort of production-centered activities more interest-driven, a la Connected Learning or, or Dewey, um, we want uh, young people to be assuming roles that align with their interests. So if, if we have a group of three or four kids who are, are programming uh, a video game, we might have one person who's really focusing on the creation of the characters because they're really into drawing. And so they want to do some digital drawing and create you know, their characters and settings. We might have another person who is really a gamer. And what they understand is, is what we would refer to as the mechanics of play, right? Um, what, what the most uh, engaging, fun um, game mechanic would be. And so they're maybe thinking about the actual play experience. And they might be doing like a paper prototype um, sort of describing what would happen, or a storyboard. And then we might have one person who's a computer nerd. Um, I don't use that, that term uh, pejoratively, by the way. We love computer nerds at Museum of the Moving Image. But someone who's really actually interested in the programming of the code. And uh, if you got three young people like that together into a group, they'll assume those roles naturally. And, um, that, um, that is more likely to result in um, a powerful learning experience because they will learn from each other, but they'll also have an opportunity to really go further with their own interests. And that's definitely the pedagogical approach that we take in any production-centered activity at the museum. Do you have a method of measuring the change in the students rather than the output or other than the output? And how do parents react to the program? Right. Um, OK, so two separate uh, but related questions. The first, um, I'm glad this came up because this is a hugely important question, the question of evaluation. You know, I had mentioned um, the Guggenheim uh, study of the learning through art program. And uh, you know, we're all trying to find ways of quantitatively measuring the success of our programming as museums. I am of the opinion that um, for field trips that are, uh, you know, like maybe like three hours long, that happen maybe once when a young person is in fourth grade, and then maybe they come back when they're in seventh grade, and then again when they're in high school, that it's very difficult to um, understand what the impact of those field trips are because frequently the impact is something that you don't even see until 20 years later. And now, you know, we have, we have filmmakers who come to the museum who say, I came to this place when I was a kid and it's what made me want to make movies. But good luck quantifying that and using that as evidence for why the field trip programs and the school group programs are important. Now, with longitudinal or with, with intensive programs or like multi-week programs where you're really developing a more robust curriculum, we have evaluated our programs. It takes money. It's normally done best when it's done by someone who isn't you. Um, but when you're bringing in an outside evaluator who's listening to what your learning goals are and is, I, I still find usually from both qualitative and, and quantitative uh, data at determining your success in, in actually achieving the goals that you had. Um, but, you know, that, that is something that we do and uh, we always strive to do, especially when a project is funded and there's the money to support that. Now, in terms of the, in terms of the parents, um, I, you know, one thing that I would say is that uh, parents know that their kids are consuming media all the time. And they also know that their kids are sort of like 
noodling around with media. So they're editing things uh, you know, on their computer or on their phone, they're playing games, they're creating Facebook pages, they're doing all of this stuff, but they don't know how meaningful it is, and they don't know that there's something really educational behind it. And one of the things that we find is that uh, parents respond very positively um, to the programs that you know, they're paying to enroll their kids in because they do see the, the pedagogy behind it. And that is apparent in, in the finished work. And it's always important to us to have, even in the shortest workshop, to have a moment where everyone gathers with the parents, especially for the younger kids, and looks at the work. Um, because normally there, we hope, there is real learning that's demonstrated in the product. But I should also add that in everything that we do, we still emphasize process over product. So we never um, manipulate or change or improve students' work just so that it looks better to the parents when the parents arrive. To us, that process of creating and even judging the finished work, that should be driven by the young person. I know that you're also in charge of the visitor experience. Right. So do you have uh, specific methods to pick the tools uh, to enrich the visitor experience, like visitor experience maps? How do you segment them? Thank you. Absolutely. Um, you know, we do, we certainly do provide, um, we provide handouts to visitors when they come that has a map of the museum and also has information about everything that's going on in the building at any given time. One of, one of uh, the challenges that we have um, in terms of visitor experience is that we have many different audiences that are coming for different things. So frequently, if you came on a Saturday or a Sunday, you might see a few hundred people who are coming just to see a movie, and you might see another three or 400 people who are coming to see the exhibition, and you might have another 50 people who are coming to participate in a workshop. What that means is that somehow we need to find a way of communicating everything that's going on without pigeonholing our visitors into a certain demographic or into a certain itinerary of programs. So that's a challenge, and that's something that we constantly work on. Um, and we do conduct visitor surveys. Again, we find that visitor surveys work best when you're working with people outside the organization um, because uh, we, whether we realize it or not, we have our own self-perception biases where we think that we're good at some things and we think that we're bad at other things. Um, so I'll give you a great example from a recent visitor survey. Our building, which you saw a little bit of, is uh, designed partly to be disorienting. Um, clever architecture, right? Um, so when visitors arrive, I find that they are frequently confused. They don't know where to go. They don't even quite know how to get to the exhibitions, even though there's like a, a stairway right, right in the middle of the lobby. And um, it takes them a while. And so I fully expected um, when we uh, did our last visitor survey that visitors would say that they found the, the signage in the museum to be inadequate or confusing, because I see that confusion on their faces when they first arrive. Um, now, one of the interesting things is that that visitor survey was conducted largely as a post-visit survey, right? Because how are you going to talk about the signage until you've actually been through the museum and experienced the signage? And um, we were rated above the, the standard benchmark for clarity of signage. So what that tells me is that even if the architecture is succeeding in disorienting visitors when they walk through our doors, after they've been through the museum, they find it to be clearly and coherently laid out with signs that tell you where to go and what to do. Um, so, you know, the, I think it is important to um, get, get real data of using an outside evaluator of some kind um, that really measures the visitor experience to hear from them because I do find that um, that data, the surprises that come, that, that come from that data are um, often quite illuminating. And they tell you something about what you're doing well and what you, what you need to work on. Uh, hi. About the educators, 
how many educators work in the museum and what kind of professionals are there? Um, for example, are they um, teachers, art teachers, or like, or specific field experts? Right. Uh, thank you for asking that question. Um, we have a team of, in, in the education department, I oversee two full-time staff members who are senior educators. And uh, um, then we have a part-time teaching staff of about 20 museum educators who work between 8 and 20 hours a week. They're responsible for facilitating all of the programs that happen on site at the museum with a few exceptions that I'll get to. Um, we have found that the uh, best strategy for identifying um, effective museum educators at our museum is to find people who have some subject area expertise. Now, we're about the art history and technology of the moving image. Um, and we define the moving image broadly. So sometimes that means that we want to find an animator or a, a, like an aspiring filmmaker. Sometimes that means we want someone who has a background in media history. Um, sometimes that means that we want someone who has a background in video game design. Um, it's important for those people to also have teaching experience. It's very difficult to train someone how to be a good teacher um, in just the two weeks that we have to get our staff ready at the beginning of a school year. Um, but our subject area is far too technical for someone to come in and feel comfortable teaching in our galleries without already having some prior knowledge of, of um, what we're talking about with young people. Now, those are our educators. On top of that, <clears throat> for camps and courses, like after school courses, we'll normally bring in someone who is much more advanced, who has a graduate level degree in the making of whatever it is um, they would, the, the kids would be making in the program, but who also has teaching experience to be a lead instructor. And they're normally co-facilitating with our museum educators. So, um, you know, we do employ sort of like contract educators um, for those sorts of programs. And then finally, uh, you know, I didn't, uh, the, 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 the talk was already very long, so I didn't go into it at, uh, in the talk, but we bring in museum, uh, not museum, we bring in moving image professionals to lead master classes. So, uh, you know, we, uh, I'll give you an example, but it's the tip of the iceberg. When we did, uh, um, uh, when we had the uh, exhibition Jim Henson's Fantastic World up, um, in our Changing Exhibitions Gallery. We did a whole range of special work workshops involving televised puppetry. And there was a day-long workshop that we had that was, that was run by a man named John, John Tartaglia who um, was on Broadway uh, in a, a puppet show called Ad Avenue Q, which won a number of, of Tony Awards. Um, a very serious professional who's also done puppetry for television, had very successful children's television show. Um, so, you know, we do also work with professionals who are true experts in the field. And one of the things that we find is that uh, that is also the avenue to um, successful adult education experiences at the museum. So when we've had adults enroll in our workshops, they've been the workshops that have given them access to someone they perceive to be a high-level industry expert. Hi. Uh, it is said uh, digital activities uh, keep uh, children uh, away from the real world. Uh, what is your opinion uh, to this uh, argument? Right. Uh, so, you know, uh, I am of two minds about this in the sense that I, you know, I, I believe in, in the power of face-to-face of -face interaction. At the museum, we have offered for example, uh, professional development um, courses for teachers that were online, um, not synchronous, asynchronous online courses that we developed. Um, the value of that is that we had, we had a teacher from Ireland, we had teachers from eight other states participating in that course, right? So that, that is 
transformative because it allows the museum to reach teachers that we otherwise would never have access to. One of the things that I've found as both a facilitator and someone who has taken online courses is that um, if, you know, the, there are challenges that we encounter um, when we're not seeing each other face to face. It's harder sometimes to, to probe as deeply um, and to have the, the sort of lively discussion that uh, can sometimes unfold in a, in a classroom. Now, in terms of young people specifically, though, what I would say is that for them, the digital is a part of the real world. It's, there, there isn't, there isn't a, a division between what is happening on their phones or on their Facebook pages um, or on their computers and um, what happens in real life. Now, the digital can amplify, um, it can um, create contextual challenges, but you know, part of what I was trying to get at in my discussion of uh, the MacArthur-funded research on digital media and learning and connected learning um, and comparing it to Dewey is that you know, young people are still young people, but what we do have to understand is that technologies create a different way of relating to one another um, it creates new social spaces. And I think the best work, the best research that has been done in this field of digital media and learning um, has started off being primarily either anthropological or in a sense like ethnographic. The idea that um, uh, researchers are trying to first understand what's really happening. What are young people really doing? Because then what that allows us to say is not, well, how, what is the digital and then what is the real and you know, is the digital good or bad? Instead, it allows us to say like, okay, what is the real world for young people today? How is the digital a part of that? And how can we as educators, citizens, parents, um, museum professionals, um, you know, nonprofit leaders, um, elected officials, um, how can we all use that knowledge to um, help young people um, prepare themselves for life in the 21st century. Because, you know, the digital is not going away. Um, this new networked culture that we're talking about is, is only going to become increasingly networked, not less so. So, the, you know, the, the research has started, and I think appropriately so, with this question of like, let's actually understand what young people are doing. Now the challenge with that is that the technology changes so rapidly that by the time you feel like you've understood how young people are engaging with one another and engaging in learning and engaging in play and engaging in all of these different social practices of which learning is one, um, by the time you understand that, they're maybe doing that differently. You know, so it, a, simple, a, a simple example is that, you know, like six or seven years ago, um, texting was not a primary form of communication. Today, good luck getting a teenager to respond to an email, right? But as a museum professional, I can tell you that's actually a challenge. If I'm trying to get um, teens to come to a design jam we're having as a follow-up to a, a week-long camp that we did, it's easier for me to email them from my museum account than it is for me to get a text message onto their phone because I'm not going to use my cell phone to do that, right? And also it raises questions of appropriateness, right? These are all challenges, but we have to take seriously um, the rapid pace at which the tools young people are using change. And we also need to take seriously the fact that we are inevitably, inevitably caught up in generational divides about how different people use different technologies. And so we'll constantly need to study each new generation of young people to, to understand what they're really doing. Because if we want to leverage that knowledge effectively, um, we have to sort of stay on top of in, on top of the studying. Just at this point now, 
uh, you have very well defined the rea real world of the young generation. But how about the senior citizens now, senior people? Because possibly they feel a bit like there's a new language being spoken around and they are just staying aside and may they may possibly have difficulties to understand what's going on and what they this language is like. Right. So what do you have especially for them? Right. Um, well, in terms of s programming for seniors, the first thing that I'll say is that um, the programming that we do has diminished in recent years. And uh, I, you know, I, I hate to focus on money, but part of the reason why a, a, a big part of my early talk acknowledged the, the role that uh, the considerations of funding play in our programming is that um, senior programs have taken a significant um, funding hit in, in New York City especially mm -hmm. over the past several years. And um, with seniors increasingly um, having difficulty even getting food um, from the senior centers to which they go, for example, um, there often um, aren't the resources around to be able to support the sort of cultural programming that we offer and that we have offered with seniors in the past. Now, when seniors come to the museum, I think that uh, to some extent we've tried in all of our uh, technological interventions in the museum to make the technology invisible. So our interactive experiences are not about the technology, they're about the process or the learning goal. And so we find that seniors tend to not be resistant to those. We also have done cultural programs with seniors where they've been working with the technology. And again, if you make the technology unintimidating and sort of um, invisible to them, then they're happy to engage. But there is a, a little bit of a reticence there that you certainly don't have with a young person. You know, it's like if you put a computer in front of a young person, they're going to start like doing things with it, whether it's mindful or not. Um, most interestingly, I would say, we're, we're, we just wrapped up a project where we had um, a group of senior citizens working with a group of teenagers to remix um, media that uh, featured negative depictions of senior citizens from television and the internet. And uh, it was um, quite a learning experience because it really did illuminate exactly that tension where the, the, the seniors wanted to defer to the young person as, as the, the person responsible for using the technology. And they were there to help inform the content. Um, that might have been a failing of program design, though. And I think that you know, if we were to do this program again, we would look a lot more closely at um, particularly how the technology was introduced at the very beginning and the context in which the technology was introduced. Um, because I think, I think that we might have failed in pushing the kids and the seniors together too quickly and not making the seniors feel confident enough in their own skills before they were already working with the teens. Thank you.